All right. I'd say let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to finding your uh, community webinar. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Yolanda Natividad with the American Ceramic Society. Um, I wanted to briefly introduce our um, host uh, or moderator today, who is uh, Dr. Rafael Jaramillo. Um, he is the Thomas Lord Associate Professor of Materials Science and Engineering at MIT. Um, his research group works mostly on synthesis and characterization of chalcogonide, hopefully I said that correctly, semiconductors. Um, and I will at this point go ahead and turn it over to Rafael. All right, thank you, Yolanda. Um, I assume everyone can hear me. So uh, thanks so much for joining us this evening. I'm going to briefly introduce the panel um, and first the topic, and we'll, then we'll have at it. So uh, finding your community, this is meant to be a discussion of the importance of community for professional advancement and fulfillment for a target audience of early career folks, early career researchers in academia and industry. Um, the description, well, you know, community is tremendously important in our careers for advancement and impact and for personal fulfillment. Um, being part of a community is an activity. It's not passive. It requires more than doing research in our individual groups and publishing in journals. Uh, some people were born into their community. For instance, if, if you followed in the footsteps of your advisor in a particular field, um, others move between fields, right? And, and uh, you need to build communities often from the ground up. And so this next hour is going to be a discussion on those topics, on the importance of scientific community and how to find, build, and maintain them. So at the end of the hour, we hope you will have learned of stories of how others have found, built, and maintained research communities. You'll have a little bit of space to reflect on the importance of community in your own careers. And you'll learn some tips and tricks for successful community building. All right, so I wanna introduce our panelists. I'm gonna introduce each panelist with a, a little more background than perhaps is, is typical for a talk or a webinar. And the reason is that you know our, our personal trajectories, that is the, the career trajectories that, that each of our panelists took is kind of salient today, right? It's of interest. So I'm gonna start with Paul. Paul Evans is a professor of material science and engineering at University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he has been since 2002. Paul received a PhD in 2000 in applied physics at Harvard while working with Gene Golovchenko. Paul's thesis focused on methods employing lead monolayers to mediate low temperature epitaxial growth of silicon. Crucially, lead is isoelectronic for silicon and thus residual lead did not result in the doping of the epitaxial layers. This low temperature process allowed the trapping of extremely high dopant densities and yielded what was at the time, the record high concentration of electrically active arsenic dopants in silicon. Golovchenko had very wide ranging interests, including in x-ray scattering, which had an important effect in the next stages of Paul's career. Paul was a postdoctoral researcher at Bell Lab from 2000 to 2002, working with Dr. Eric Isaac. At Bell Labs, Paul developed and employed synchrotron X-ray diffraction methods, employing a very tightly focused X-ray beam. The timing was good because the third generation synchrotron light sources like the advanced photon source in Illinois were only just beginning to be used for hard X-ray microscopy. Paul applied those techniques to probe antiferromagnetic domains in chromium and expanded his interests in electronic materials by starting a series of studies on ferroelectric thin films. At the University of Wisconsin, Paul has continued his interest in X-ray scattering and oxide electronic materials. His most recent work there includes the fabrication of novel oxide thin film using solid phase epitaxy and a continuing interest in developing and applying X-ray scattering methods. A recently particularly interesting series of studies involves the discovery of a range of unexpected changes in the ferroelectric domain configuration and polarization driven by ultra-fast optical pumps, optical pulses. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, Jessica Rimsa is a senior member of the technical staff in the geochemistry department and Sandia National Laboratories, where she has been since 2018. Jessica received her PhD in 2016 in material science and engineering at the University of North Texas, working with Dr. Jincheng Du. 
Her thesis research focused on identifying mechanisms of dissolution in silicate glasses, including mechanisms of silicon oxygen bond breakage and the development of hydrated gel structures. Additional work focused on the stability of a range of oxide amorphous materials, including organosilicates used in the semiconductor processing industry. As a graduate student, she spent two summers abroad, one at Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, France in 2014, investigating amorphous pyrophosphate structures for biomedical applications, and another at the University of Electronic Science and Technology in Chengdu, China in 2015 evaluating defect states in lithium silicates. Jessica joined Sandia National Laboratories in 2016 as a postdoc in the geochemistry department, working on the molecular scale modeling of chemomechanical fracture in silicate materials. She identified that non-additive effects of chemical and stress caused fracture, and that accessibility of fractures by dissolved ions is a critical factor controlling subsurface fracture. Following, her conversion to a staff scientist position in 2018, her work has expanded to focus on the modeling of aging and reliability of cementitious materials and on the degradation of functional metal organic materials for gas separation. Thank you and welcome, Jessica. Krista Carlson joined the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering at the University of Nevada, Reno, UNR, as an associate professor in 2021. She started her academic career in 2016 at the University of Utah in the Department of Material Science and Engineering, where she is currently an adjunct assistant professor. Carlson received her PhD in glass science at the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University in 2008. After graduate school, Carlson worked for Corning in a specialty materials segment as a development scientist. During this time, she developed methods to produce anti-glare surfaces on Gorilla Glass, and of a quantification of the resulting surface appearance. This research led to two patents. Carlson's passion for water led her to a career pivot where she began to focus on materials for water purification. After some time in the Yukon cleaning up mine tailings using bioreactors, she shifted to the academic research at the University of Utah, where as a research associate, she developed point of use titanium oxide based devices for drinking water purification. Her interest expanded into global water quality and her participation in the U.S. Pakistan Center for Advanced Studies in Water. She now collaborates with researchers at the Mehran University of Engineering and Technology on scaling her titanium oxide-based technology to residential scale systems. Carlson's interest in the development of new materials for environmental purposes has led her to other primary research focus, the development of materials for the capture and immobilization of radioactive elements produced during nuclear related processes. She has been developing methods to dehalogenate salt waste generated during electro refining and molten salt reactor operation and the subsequent production of chemically and mechanically durable halide free ceramic waste forms comprised of analogous geological mineral assemblages. As the off gas from these processes also needs to be managed. Her group has recently developed metal functionalized high specific surface area membrane for radio iodine capture. Thank you and welcome, Krista. All right, so I want to start with a pretty um, basic question, which is what is scientific community? And maybe I'll go in the opposite order of the introductions. And Krista, we can begin with you. Can you repeat that? Sorry, it cut out. What is scientific community? What is scientific community? Um, I actually don't have a very clear answer. <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, it is who you're surrounded by in whatever career you are in. So when I was at Corning, um, my scientific community was the technician and research scientist that I was working with. and that uh, we were all focused on developing this product and we all had a very similar background. Um, when I went and pivoted to looking at water purification, then my scientific community was much more broad. It was, I was the only material scientist. I was mainly working with civil engineers and mechanical engineers. And so you get a lot of different perspectives. And so I think that um, the scientific community just shifts with 
uh, whatever research area you are working on. Um, do you find it easy? Did you find it easy to shift and to know how long? Maybe I should ask it a different way. When you shifted into water purification, how long did it take for you to figure out who your community was and who you needed to be talking to? And this this was something that um, I'm very thankful that I talk to everybody and I feel very comfortable uh, putting myself out there and 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 being okay with with um, uh, yeah, putting my, myself in maybe a little more uncomfortable situations because it was a very different community going from material science to um, uh, being up at a mine camp, essentially, um, near the Arctic Circle and working with people who are like, materials, what? You know, <laughs> so they knew about separations, they were uh, in hydrometallurgy. But um, yeah, I, I think that um, you have to be, I guess you, you just have to be willing to do enough research about the area to be able to pivot and have the passion for it. I ended up um, realizing that I really wanted to go into water research when um, I went to China, we were putting this process into production and I was looking at, you know, uh, this, this waste production. And it really made me start to think about where does this waste go? What do we do with it? And that, ended up leading me to the the water community um and so i think that if if you do have a passion for shifting to another community just make sure you um do the research in that community and make sure you're ready to make that pivot and start at the the bottom you know i mean you really when i started over i was back to you know <laughs> square one um no one knew who i was um and you have to uh, yeah, establish yourself again as someone who's credible and um, in a brand new field. And without having that background, it does look very interesting. Someone's like, you have a glass science degree. What are you doing here? Um, so I had to justify my existence at this place and, and show them that I could, you know, knew what experiments I was going to run, how I was going to collect the data, what I was going to do. Um, and so, yeah, you end up having to work a little bit more, but it's worth it if you are really interested in that area. Good. So pivot and passion. Uh, Jessica, what is a scientific community to you? So for me, um, you know, a lot of times at Sandia, when we're working on different like applications and projects and stuff, um, usually I'm the only kind of modeler or the person with my background on the project. And that happens a lot because um, if there was more than one person who could do what I do, they would, wouldn't need me, right? They're trying to <laughs> really focus on making sure that they have the skills that they need. So for me, you know, that those are my technical working groups, my collaborators, my, my project teammates or leads, right? Um, and for me, my scientific communities is people that are outside of maybe my institution or inside, but have the same background and skills and expertise. So I kind of think about it like um, if you would recognize them in person and if I would include them as a reviewer for a paper I wrote, then I'm like, all right, this is a person who's part of my scientific community, right? Um, because it means that we must have some of the same skill sets. You know, they might be recommending me for stuff. We might collaborate or bounce ideas off of. Um, so that's, that's a lot what I, you know, think of when I think of my scientific community. Um, and, you know, to follow on to the question uh, that Krista had um, kind of about pivoting. Um, so, you know, my background is all in material science and engineering, um, and it's all in glass science and atomistic modeling. Um, and then I ended up getting hired at Sandia into a geology department, right? Um, and a geochemistry department too. So, you know, my scientific community was traditionally you know, the legacy, right, was the American Ceramic Society. And then I started being involved with the American Chemical Society and with uh, American Geophysical Union and all these other, you know, people were saying, hey, what about my scientific community? Or can't you come over to my scientific community too? Um, and it's been interesting kind of developing different scientific communities with different applications and traditional backgrounds. Um, and for me, that's been really valuable um, because it has actually opened up my eyes to a lot of other research that wasn't in my original native scientific community, if you will, right? Um, silicate glasses aren't that different from minerals, which aren't that different from magmas, right? Which aren't that different from engineered ceramics. So um, I've, I really like having different 
you know, having a scientific um, community with different backgrounds and specialties, because I think it's been valuable in kind of broadening my understanding of the application of some of the work that I that I do on my day to day basis. That was interesting because with Krista, her her community shifted as as her application shifted, and her community became a bunch of people in the fields up in Yukon, right? And and your answer was almost the opposite. It's it, it, if they're a, a collaborator, they're not in my community, right? Because of the way that you staff projects at Sandia, perhaps you know, the, you know, if there were more than one person like you, you know, there wouldn't be that situation. So, so your community is more dispersed, and you have to maybe communicate with them differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Paul, what does a scientific community do? I, I don't have a lot to add to those great answers, but I, I think that the, as I was listening, I was struck by the, by the idea that it's, it can be a combination of the people you collaborate with and the fields that you're trying to, to work in, but, um, and also the people who understand how you think about problems. So uh, I'd like to I'd like to kind of think that if you take your ideas to a new area, you can try to de develop that sense of scientific community with people. But the the people that you were uh, working with before may understand how you like to think about problems and still stay part of your scientific community, even though you're maybe not working in the same direction as them. And you know, as as Jessica says, everybody needs enough space around them to be able to have their impact and um, so you often may meet with people after not seeing them for a while and, and immediately understand their strategy for what they're trying to do, even if they're doing something completely different because of because you were you shared their thoughts, uh, their, their ways of thinking about the field for a while. So I would I would I guess define it from both of those perspectives, or maybe it's maybe it's more generally it's the people that you rely on in your scientific life to to provide feedback and opportunities and uh, uh, ideas. Good. Um, and it's not the same thing as department, right? And this, this probably goes without saying for a lot of us who have, you know, years removed from degree programs. Um, but the closer you are to a degree program, I think uh, perhaps you tie the thought of community more to maybe your graduate student cohort, you know, or the department you came up from, uh, came up through. And it's interesting for me to reflect on, on how different uh, these, these are these are partially overlapping, but definitely not fully overlapping circles in the Venn diagram. Right? Is your community versus your the department you came from, you came up in. So let's get to the meat of this. Why is it important? Who cares, right? Why why don't and maybe to set up a um, a, a, a bit of a straw man argument, right? Why can't we just be so smart and good at science that we publish an amazing paper and and we just have success and personal fulfillment? <laughs> why do we need community? Um, Chris, I'll come back to you. Uh, for me, I just like collaborating with other people. Um, sometimes you like working with people, sometimes you don't. I enjoy the collaborative process. Um, I really like getting different people's perspectives, especially if they're coming from a different field. Um, I work with people from our um, dental school. I work with people at the VA, I work with people in other um, engineering disciplines. And um, I enjoy the way that we do look at things differently to solve problems. Um, so that's, that's, uh, I think, kind of why I enjoy that. But if you don't like working with people, then <laughs> maybe you don't need a community as much. Um, but it is good to get that, that feedback as well, because you might think you're going in a uh, uh, direction that's going to lead to something and someone um, in your community, like when you have, that's why we have peer review, right? So that we know where we need to improve or, or make some changes. So, and that's why it's important as well. Maybe um, even for folks who don't like collaborating as much as you do, um, are there reasons why it still is important to focus on this topic? peer review, make sure our science is <laughs> strong. And <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, you could you could be going down a completely um, incorrect or not incorrect, but uh, maybe not the best path. And so um, having the ability to communicate with others and, and just check yourself is, is really important. So 
Yeah. That's why I would say, even if you aren't comfortable interacting with others, uh, still try to find people that, that you can um, get honest feedback from. You, you want people yeah. that are gonna give you constructive criticism, but make sure that they do um, evaluate your, your work in a realistic manner. Yeah. I mean, peer review, I'm sure we've all had this experience plenty of times. It isn't often the most useful feedback. Um, <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and often you're not gonna get that really valuable strategic stuff like, why are you doing this research, right? You, you might get some comments that you, you, know, you forgot to label your, your units or something, you know, it's a, um, which maybe is to your point that uh, just submitting papers and getting peer review isn't enough to get that feedback. Right? You need to get that yeah, through other forms. Definitely find a mentor wherever you are. And I think that's um, one of the nice parts about most of, I, I know at Corning, they had a really good mentoring program. I know in academia, usually when you come in, they um, don't necessarily assign you a mentor, but you try to find one in the department because mm -hmm. the rules to get tenure are not necessarily the most clear, right? Um, and so it is important for you to reach out because it's no one's responsibility to help you. You need to help yourself. So that is good to find. Yeah, you know, someone in. That's, a good, that's a good message. Um, Jessica, why is scientific community important for your career? Um, I, but first of all, I think it helps provide kind of like Chris was saying some of that, you know, technical support and pitfalls ahead of time. Right. Um, the other thing is just the, the society that we live in, I think wherever you are, uh, you know, I think we would be a bit naive to think that we could sit alone in a room and do kind of really discovery world-class research alone. Right. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you need people who have your back, who can recommend you for things, who can have a, a clear, you know, eyes for when you don't. Right. I've asked for copies of successful grants to see about formatting, you know, like mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff would be really difficult to get on your own. Um, and even the, the smartest and most capable scientist among us would be really hard pressed to do it alone. Right. Um, things like tenure committees, you have to have invited talks. You have to have people who write letters for you, you know, in, internally, you know, to Sandia, people are looking for subject matter experts for critical, you know, mission related applications. And so who, you know, and who knows you and who can kind of put you forward that ends up really kind of being critical. Um, and, you know, and some of that does depend if you're lucky enough to do hundred percent discovery, scientific research on your own, that's, and you like that, that's great. But I think that's a, a pretty rare position right um and the other thing i'm struck with is the the size of the problems that we have to tackle right mm -hmm. you know um it's you know i could spend my whole life just looking at the strength of that sio bond in different conditions right but now it's like oh well we're over that we need to know how to predict the stability of you know cement based infrastructure for the next 100 years with changing you know environmental conditions and you're like whoa right me, a whole lifetime of my research alone couldn't touch that, right? And so you need to start collaborating and tackle some of these really kind of big problems with a really big team and a really big scientific community um, just to have a chance at putting a dent in some of these. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I think know, knowing people and having people know you is worth it, right? Like um, yeah. it really is kind of what you need, I think, to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, you hit on, on a couple of things. One is networking, which gets a bad rap, but it shouldn't, right? Um, and you also had a, had a bit of a slip where you said if you're, if you're lucky enough to, to be someone who can do discovery science on their own, which, which slips a value judgment, which I don't think I agree with, right? All Meaning right. that uh, I don't think that, uh, that many of us just wouldn't enjoy that and wouldn't be good at it, both at the same time. And I'm okay with that, right? <laughs> I, I, I only am really uh, successful as, as such by virtue of working with others, and I'm completely comfortable with saying that, right? And I hope other can, others can be too, right? So, so it's, it's um, I, I think I'd like to tear down a little bit that sort of lone scientist um, um, stereotype because of your second point, which is that the problems we have to solve are such that um, it requires collaboration. So two really good points. Um, and we should, and, and points we should come back to, which is a little bit more, uh, bread and butter points about promotion of tenure right <laughs> and, and getting ahead in academia which you know we definitely have to cover uh, in this hour paul why is scientific community important to you i think the um 
maybe maybe to add to what Krista and Jessica have said, you, there's a perspective where you where you start to um, realize that the community doesn't exist without the people that are part of it, and so you can you can establish and influence directions if you can act as a group of people in the community in a way that you can't if you act alone. And so things in my own, my own environment or my own research um, area often have to do with the use of uh, extremely highly advanced uh, shared facilities. And things like the synchrotron light sources or the um, uh, nanoscience centers rely on a scientific community to help them articulate their goals and to their productivity, their impact, and, and, to, and to identify future directions. And so if you are part of the community um, when those things come along and are, are those opportunities to define the future come along, then you can have a voice that gets magnified because the ideas get picked up by the by um, not just your own voice, but the community's voice can can speak in a way that that many people individually would have a lot of trouble. Yeah. And so that's a, a big a big reason to know those know that group of people is so that together you can do something. The society's the same way. If you want to have a symposium at a meeting that uh, broadens the research area and shows that there are connections, then you need to have a community of people who can propose it. Um, and similarly with uh, with grant programs and things where there are ways to participate if your community is ready to articulate um, those things. And that, that comes, um, that, that, that doesn't come too much longer than the time that you're talking about, Raphael. So you, know, you start writing up those ideas um, about the time that, that you, know, you start transitioning into, um, into jobs uh, after postdoctoral appointments, for example. Somehow I became muted. I don't know how that happened. I mean, those are those are good points. I, I um, think about advice I give to uh, seniors that are applying to grad school, and I say, you know, um, the the grant that is going to support your PhD is being written now, or it was written six months ago, and and you say, oh, I, I don't have infinite freedom, right? Um, my boundary conditions are established by forces external, and if you go to a B mine facility and you really knock it out of the park you're still sort of carrying out someone else's agenda to some extent because you know the, the tools you have and maybe even the scientific questions you're asking were defined by conversations that happened maybe five years ago and so um you know going up professionally is maybe a process of seeing that and saying oh i see if i really want to have impact and feel long-term fulfillment i need to be in those conversations and it becomes the skills required or not necessarily those technical skills, but more about communication and patience, right? which is not something we really uh, teach <laughs> in grad school and MSc, communication and patience, right? It's normally the opposite, right? Don't talk, get it done quickly or something like that. So I think those are really good points. Um, so uh, I, want, I want to move on. We talked about the importance of scientific community for career advancement, um, career impact, uh, inspiration to get ideas and fulfillment. Um, let's get a little more specific and, and talk about that career advancement because I bet that's of interest to the audience, right? What um, I received good advice over various you know, over the years. Um, I'm sure others have as well. In what specific ways do you need to have that scientific community to have your back, right? To, to advance, whether it be in academia or um, or industry. And it's, it, let's try to get specific because I think this would be more helpful the more specific we are. For folks on the line. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start, uh, I'll go with the reverse order. I'll come back to you, Paul, and then and I'll work then. So spe your specific ways the community helps. Um, well, that would, it's been touched on a little bit in terms of very personal things like um, like writing the writing letters and serving on evaluation, um, evaluative uh, committees and things. You have to, it helps to have people who maybe understand your perspective a little bit before they're asked, uh, or can put the field in perspective for the people who are reading the letters. So mm -hmm. often if you're in a, any kind of group of people, uh, as Jessica says, you, you have to be distinct 
from those people locally. And that means that the rest of the people with you have to have what you do explained to them at, at some level in order to understand how to evaluate you. And so those group of people who can articulate, you know, Paul does this because that's how we do things. It, or does this because that's where this comes from. Uh, and your impact can be very useful. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other, uh, maybe, maybe one other way it's useful is you got to get these jobs. And getting jobs is a really important part of keeping jobs. So, and having a job. So, so you, need, you need to have the community um, in some sense aware of who you are at a stage that, that's not that, that, you know, so that, so that when it becomes time for people to say, I really wish we had someone like Raf, then they can, then, you know, they, they can kind of say, well, we can't get him, but we'll, we'll get some, we'll get this person and have that awareness in the community that you're around is very, very important, very specifically. It's, it's not quite the same as fame, but it's a little bit about, about making sure that people know who you are um, in a group of people that's identifiable. So the idea there is, is about narrative. You told about stories that Paul does this because he had this great way of utilizing the new sources and now we've all you know, followed in his footsteps or Paul does that other thing because he saw a connection with a disparate field, you know, and that's about narrative storytelling, right? Individual papers don't tell that story. That's your point that you have to have a letter writer kind of know the story already before they, they get that. And just to be really clear, um, I'm not sure if everyone here on the line knows exactly how the tenure and promotion process works in universities. What are these letters? Paul, coming. Uh, yeah, so fine. so at, it, it, it varies a little bit from place to place um, at, at, at the University of Wisconsin Madison where I am you um, there's a promotion that's mandate that's promotion um, that you're required to be considered for promotion after um, a certain number of years. Part of that process is an evaluation by your peers in the field that the, uh, is solicited and evaluated by the department that um, that is considering you for tenure. And so the department then asks for these, these letters from people that they understand and hopefully who understand you also and can help explain you to them uh, and your impact. And they're, they're weighted very heavily. They're typically you know, very thoughtful letters. I would say that they take on the order of eight to 10 hours each to write if you're good, if you're fast, several pages. And so you need to be able, it's very hard to go in cold to those. If the people don't know you at least a little bit beforehand, then it, it can be difficult. So you wanna get out and meet the potential people and, and make sure that you're known to them and, and the people around you know who your community is so they can ask them. Yeah, yeah. So that's, um, that's a really specific and important reason to, to have a community before you reach that point. Um, Jessica. Um, yeah, so we, we actually have a, a somewhat similar system um, for our internal promotions. Um, of course, as with many things, Sandia pre prefers internal reviewers, right, <laughs> rather to external, um, which also means that some of your scientific community has to be internal as well, right, to state your, you know, mission relevance. Um, I will also say that, and maybe this is appropriate for this group as well, um, really your scientific network cannot be understated for the ability to find positions and jobs. Um, this is something that Sandians and other people in National Labs specifically run into because our scientific community tends to include mostly staff and professors, right? So when it comes time to hire a postdoc or a student, you know, especially with COVID, I'd be hard pressed to name students, right? I haven't seen them. They're not on site, right? I don't mentor any, no one has a friend of a friend, right? Um, and it does make it really difficult. You know, um, I've alluded sometimes to a shattery underground postdoc network, which is how you get hired, right? And that's just code for scientific community, right? Who knows you? <laughs> Who knows your you know, that you're graduating, who, who's looking for someone like you, who heard a story or who knows a grant got funded, right? All of that stuff is really tangible things, right, that people can benefit from. Um, another thing that's really helpful um, is, you know, one of the, uh, the metrics for success for, for me and for my type of position is um, deliverables, like papers and publications and stuff like that. And um, as a really specific instance, we had a project that had started in the fall of 2019, and it was pretty much stopped when COVID hit. 
But luckily, someone in my scientific community had asked, had asked me to write a book chapter. So I was able to write a book chapter and that got published. And so the project looked successful, even though we hadn't been able to run any experiments for the last like nine months, right? Um, and so it, you know, being known helped me in that case because it kept kind of a continuum of publishable material coming out, even when a lot of things were just insane, right? Um, and so it's, it's kind of things like that where, you know, being connected to those opportunities that you might not know exist. Um, in a, in a similar way, uh, Amer the American Sermon Society has different types of scientific committees um, that I didn't know existed, uh, and I had been heavily involved with ACERS for many years, and it wasn't until someone in my scientific community recommended me for a position that I even knew that was an opportunity to get involved. So I think it, you know, in terms of you know, I wish scientists were better at publicizing some of these opportunities, but we're just not, right? And we yeah. really rely upon knowing each other uh, to get a lot of this information communicated effectively. Yeah, that's a good point. I like your story about sort of communities you don't even know you should be part of. Um, it's not like high school, you walk into the cafeteria and the whole thing is there in front of you, all the torture and <laughs> joy and heartbreak. I mean, but you could see it all. And in science, you know, there could be really important communities, even within your own department that you're not aware of because you haven't been told or you're not at the right rank or, or, or whatnot. And, and definitely once you get you know, beyond a, you know, a, a national organization like ACERS, right? Maybe it's listed somewhere, but who reads mm -hmm. lists? I mean, you know, you, you know, <laughs> you know so uh, that's a really good point. Um, Krista, what, what, what would you say are some, some points uh, by which scientific community is important for career advancement? Uh, the the one uh, one very very specific example was um, breaking into the nuclear waste form community and um, for me uh, my my chair um, at University of Utah he had spent 15 plus years at Idaho National Laboratory before um, joining our department and I ended up um, he, he ended up mentoring me and we paired up for a nuclear energy um, university program proposal. Uh, which got funded. And after that, um, I would go to campaign meetings. I was meeting more people at the national labs. And that was very, very helpful to understand um, the different waste streams. And that led to mm. um, another few opportunities for me that I would not have had otherwise. So I always um, am very thankful for his mentorship because without him, I don't I don't think it would have been um, easy or maybe even possible to to break in this community. Um, yeah. And he, he, he knew what the problems were. You know, when you have some at the National Lab, they are familiar with how you need to, to frame um, the proposal to be successful. Yeah, yeah that's good. I, I think of an analogy of a party that's happening across the street. You really wanna be at that party, right? If you don't know anybody, you know, what do you, you can go hang out in the kitchen and not talk to anybody. But if you know someone who's connected, um, you can be swept up. And, and, and uh, that's what your story sort of sounded like. <laughs> you had the interest, you had the skill, but that wasn't enough. You also needed that, that sort of introduction. Yeah, that's good. Um, so let's talk about how you found your communities. And um, uh, we can come back to Paul and say, you know, and maybe I'll, I'll ask you to focus on, on events or initiatives you took that required a little bit of discomfort or, you know, a little bit of a, little bit of a step into the, you know, unknown where you say, um, I'm going to give this a shot. Yeah. I can, I can give, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, uh, these things, the discomfort is real and uh, and, you know, it, it has to do with not just social anxiety, but also a little bit of imposter syndrome kind of feeling sometimes that, you know, who, how am I supposed to be telling people who are experts about this, that I'm an expert um, because I've been, I've been involved in this. So I, I, I can think of maybe two examples that are, that are useful. One as an earlier, early career person and another later on. Um, one that was, one that was impactful for me was actually at a workshop defining the scientific community for the um, hard x-ray nanoprobe beamline at Argonne in December of 2000. So I was, uh, I'd been a postdoc for two months and uh, 
and they needed somebody to come and explain how this new facility that didn't exist yet would be useful for um, a suite of problems that were of interest. And I thought that was quite um, challenging because I'd been involved for two months so far and you know, assembled, assembled a talk. And um, the introduction was not as long as yours. It was, here's Paul, he's going to tell us about whatever. And get up and you go. And some of those people, you know, it turns out that you meet them that way, you're uncomfortable and you meet them. And then 20 years later, you still run into them and you can still work together because, because, you, because of putting yourself out there early on. Um, and I, I think that discomfort was, was probably illusory in some sense, in the sense that I don't think that I would have been chased off the stage chased off the front of the room or anything, but I think it was for real. And maybe another one is in similar situations where you where you um, you have to articulate that you're really part of the community and um, and put yourself put yourself forward to, to say, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna help this, I wanna help this community do this, even if that community is a little uncomfortable with it. And and uh, an example, an example there um, is maybe it's slightly different than the type of thing we've been talking about, but if you want to be an advocate for things that you'd like to have happen in the community, you have to make, might have to make people a little uncomfortable about it. And so if you want to hire people or um, advocate for hiring people or advocate for hiring people who are in um, uh, underrepresented groups or, or similar things, you have to, you have to kind of put yourself forward and join a community of people that is science, that's a scientific community, but with an interest that's, that's uh, different than your scientific interests. It's a sort of interest and in impact in the community in, um, in uh, putting people forward. So there's you know some, some hiring things here that for example, that, that require saying, no, we really need to do this and, and find a community of people who are, could be supportive. For that. Yeah. So two instances of just risking a little discomfort and, and putting yourself out there. Yeah, yeah and, and of course, sometimes the discomfort becomes real, right? That you do it and it doesn't work. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. But you have yeah. to be, you have to, you have to, you have to, it's the, it's the ones that work that are the rewarding ones. Yeah. I remember as a, as just starting out as assistant professor, I, I thought I was going to be involved in this field. I won't mention what field. And I spent a bunch of discretionary money to go to this conference in Spain. So this is going to be it. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, and it was a total washout. It was like that. It was like, I went to the party and no one talked to me. And, and I, I just never, I never looked back. I, I just walked away, and tried something else. You know, and it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, Jessica, do you have some uh, story or two about uh, finding your community? Yeah, um, first of all, I do think there's a bit of luck um, and to go with what Paul said, a bit of blind faith, right? Um, and to go all the way back to the beginning, I think you had asked Krista something about um, how she got found her new community became comfortable. And in my experience, it takes, um, you know, three conferences, right? Or three interactions or three instances to kind of be part of the community, right? So the first one is kind of a, a fly by night, right? Like you see someone, you say, hi, I like your talk, and then you kind of sneak away, right? Then the second time you say, hey, I'd like your talk. I'm doing something similar. And then you kind of chat and then you you run away. Right. And then the third time. OK, then you start saying, OK, and this is our previous work and we're thinking of doing this. And you're kind of growing that relationship mm -hmm. the same way you would meet a real person in real life. Right. You walk up and be like, we're best friends now. Right. You would have to say like, hi, and then you would run away. OK, or some of us do. But um, I just think like it just takes time to build that kind of scientific you know, group of people just way it takes time to build a support network of any kind. And I can say that um, in my experience, people really want to meet new people, right? In, in their, especially in their field. Um, and so I definitely took a case where like, I knew I was part of the glass optical materials division. And when I was a graduate student, um, they had listed a business meeting in the, it just in the program. And I just went to it. Right. Um, and my advisor was there, but he hadn't thought to invite me and no one else. And I just I just went. Right. Um, and everyone was so excited to see someone who wanted to be engaged and be part of the community. So in my experience, you know, just going to those opportunities, going to those network opportunities, even if you only stay for 10 minutes, you know, you saw someone, someone saw you, it can come up later. And, you know, if you're not ready for a big jump, you can take a lot of little steps to build kind of that community. Um, That'd be my recommendation. Uh, Good. Yeah. Thank you. Krista, 
How did you find your community? That was good. I really like that, that three times uh, meeting somebody because I think, uh, I don't know if we're, we're taught that. It, you know, it seems like almost they push us in too fast, but you're right. It is, that's a much better approach. So I like that. <laughs> I wish somebody had told me that when I was younger. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I kind of uh, ran, ran away from my um, original community, I think a little bit um, after Corning and um, I traveled quite a bit and, um, and met a lot of people and tried to figure out maybe where I could fit and had a lot of interesting experiences that, you know, weren't successful. Um, but, uh, like you, you were mentioning, you just keep moving forward and, you know, if, if you have the vision and you know where, uh, or at least what field you want to be in, you can keep progressing. Um, it might not be with a certain group of people, um, but you will find that. And so um, I think I was very fortunate. The, uh, so I worked uh, when I was in the, the Yukon uh, working with the mine tailings. That company, it was a startup company, they were associated with the University of Utah. So I ended up um, in uh, the Yukon for a while. And then we came back to Utah to, to build more systems and to look at new materials and um, I started interacting with the professors on campus. I had to use the SEM, I had to use um, different characterization equipment. And so that led to more and more conversations. And that's how I ended up getting my position at, at um, Utah. So, I mean, for me, I've been very, I feel very fortunate. I don't, um, you know, I know it's a very non-traditional path <laughs> that I took to academia and, and I still feel like I'm um, catching up, uh, I guess, with you know coming back into the glass and, and ceramic community um, after making kind of a, a larger pivot. Um, so that was good. Yeah, I, I like these stories of moving between fields because they always contain stories like that. Right? No one, no one simply says, "I want to work in this other field," and everyone says, "Oh, well, now you're in this field." Right? So we have the rule of three. There are these sort of like false starts and and connections and happenstance. So before we, uh, you know, it's approaching the bottom of the hour, and so we, we, before our audience trickles away, I want to open it up a little bit and ask whether um, folks online have any questions for the panelists. And while we're waiting, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask the panelists to think of maybe just one piece of advice for you know either graduate students near the end of their program or postdocs or assistant professors that, that you'd like to share that maybe you haven't had the chance to yet. Any questions from the audience? Jessica, raise your hand. Um, yes. It's not a, it's not a question, um, but it's kind of to ask to your second one. Um, I would really encourage people to feel confident um, making their own making their own community. Um, yeah. That if you see a niche between two existing communities and stuff, like you don't have to fit into a certain area, right? You can really make your own community, make your own symposium, make your own session, draw together the people that you want to see together, um, if that's important to you. But it does look like there's a question, so I don't want to steal that from the. <laughs> from one of the people who was attending. Well, so um, I, I don't know how we're going to get the question here. It says chat. Do you want oh, me to read uh, it? Or? Sure, sure. Um, when pivoting communities, did you find that many uh, slash any of your skills were transferable? How did you transfer them, if so? Would anyone like to take that? Wow. Uh, let me let me quickly be because Krista and Krista and Jessica are gonna have better answers. So I'll jump in quickly while I can. Uh, the 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 skills that are transferable are are the fundamental scientific and engineering skills, the um, the fun the critical thinking, the quantitative analysis, uh, the ability to work fairly with people and to be reliable, to write clearly. And those things go with you wherever wherever you go. And it turns out that, that the kinds of pivots we're talking about are 
maybe a little narrower than the global pivots. We're not talking about a pivot to, to becoming a dancer, uh, for example. And, and so those kinds of skills serve very well across all of science. And you're, you have about 90% of the game if you can keep, your, keep the basics under control. Good. Anything to add? Um, I would just say, like, you would be surprised how much of your skills are transferable. And over the course of a career, if, if the panelists are any indication here, it would be very surprising to never pivot, right? Um, most of us have changed either our application space, our materials, expanded our methods, and all of that as we've kind of progressed in, in our careers. So I, I understand that it can be scary, right? Especially for me, it's the first paper in a new area or the first presentation where you feel like if I'm going to get called out, it's going to be this time, right? But after, then the second one's easier and the third one's easier and the fourth one's easier and you can refer back to yourself and things just kind of come, you know, just kind of evolve that way. Um, and so I would encourage you not to think too narrowly of yourself in terms of like what your dis dissertation, dissertation work is. Um, it would be really tempted to say, in my case, I'm a computational class scientist, right? But that's very, very narrow, right? And a lot of my work is in a lot of other areas. So think of things like, you know, surface science, chemistry, right? Like solid state physics, right? You can do anything in that area, right? And sometimes we exist in these scientific blocks that we make for ourselves, but no one else is seeing you that way, right? Um, you can work on um, almost anything, right? Um, building your scientific community, your technical acumen or whatever it takes. Um, so I would try to embrace those opportunities to expand your skill set because this sort of cross understanding of different fields is, is really valuable. And as a material scientist, I spend an embarrassing amount of my time translating between mechanical engineers and chemists. It's like most of what I do on a daily basis, right? And they don't see me as narrow as someone who does glass, right? Obviously, I have a, I have a lot more knowledge than I'm tra translating back and forth. So um, be brave, okay? Uh, and, you know, take the risk to pivot. I think it's it's been worth it in all of my cases, um, just with the new problems that I get to solve and the new information I get to learn and the new teams I get to work with. It's, I think it's much more rewarding than kind of staying in your lane forever, but I might be biased. So. That was good. I mean, take the risk, pivot. You can create your own com a new community. Krista, you know, these are really good points that the communities that are out there, this is not static, right? This is not written in stone tablets. These are continually evolving and you have an opportunity to play a role in that to play a role. Um, any last pieces of advice? I would, I would say for people um, thinking about graduate or, or postdoc positions, don't just take the first thing that um, comes along or you, you uh, kind of go into a panic and be like, I don't have any options, so I need to go down um, this path or work with, with uh, this um, professor. I think it is important to make sure that you're really interested in that field because I know a lot of us after graduation, especially you um, maybe get a little nervous that you're not gonna find something. And so you might take something that you're not passionate about, but if you're gonna grad school, if you're gonna be a postdoc, there's a lot of hours and it's really draining if you're not doing something that you love or at least like, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, sort of, we'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I've got I've got one rough uh, last word. Paul, you can have the last someone word. someone we know someone we know uh, because Raf, Rafael and I turned out um, uh, shared some educational background at, at Cornell University. There is a, a very prominent scientist named Bob Berman who recently passed away. And uh, I this is advice he gave. He he told me, but I've seen, since seen it in print. So I think it's not it's not uh, private. And, and his advice was make good choices. And it turns out that that's, that's not as trivial a, a piece of advice as it seems. No, and so if you don't know what to do, make a good choice was his, <laughs> his, his, his way of putting it. And to make a good binary choice, establish binary choices and choose the best option. Uh, and maybe Krista, that comes back to your, your point about uh, not taking what first comes along because you're not realizing that you're making a choice that you between options. Good. I like that. I like that story about Bob Berman. He taught my uh, statistical physics class as an undergrad, kind of sent me down the path. So there was one other question in the chat. If we could get it, yes, real quick. fantastic. We can sneak that in. Um, how do you defy rejection in a new community? Huh. 
with a uh, with the thin skin and hurt feelings. Um, I don't know. I don't have a good you cry answer. briefly. Yeah, yeah. It's okay yeah. to it's okay to feel rejected and to feel upset about it, and then to realize that it's not the end and that you're, uh, you know, you could either not go to that community because they're not welcoming, or you can find that that person was not uh, giving you good advice and not reject, not rejecting you for any reason that made any sense. Um, I, I would, I would say that um, uh, academia, this is advice for the undergrads, right? They come in and they're used to just this series of successes. They coasted through high school. <laughs> and the more you stay in academia, the more your experience becomes one of continuous rejection. So first of all, there's just that fact that it, you have to, you're going to become comfortable with it sooner rather than later. But maybe more specific answer, if you get rejected by a community as a professional, I would first ask yourself, why do you want to be part of that community? The same thing you should ask yourself when you become rejected by a community in high school, right? Do I, why do I want to be in that group? And if you've got a good reason, um, then you probably will make it, right? Because you probably have the drive and the passion to pivot. You probably have something to offer. And you were rejected for reasons that just don't reflect that, right? But I can tell you from my own personal experience that sometimes your reason is kind of that you want to be cool, right? And you think it's the in group, that's the group you should join. And sometimes that rejection helps you reflect a little bit and think maybe, maybe I'm not doing this for the right reason. So make good choices, right? Yeah. So I think to tie onto that, um, one of the issues that I see sometimes when I see someone that could be perceived as rejection from a community is because they're going kind of like you said, for the coolest person, right? So if there's a Nobel lore anywhere, they're the coolest person, right? And everyone's trying to talk to them. And maybe that person is, is too busy or you feel like they brush you off, right? But maybe the best bet is if you're a graduate student, talk to another graduate student in that area, right? Who might be looking for shared kind of peer mentoring type experiences, right? Um, or the same thing might be if you're, you know, at a meeting and you can't get any time with the president of the society, maybe they're just crazy, right? They're just running around like, you know, they don't, you know, they want to be welcoming, but they just can't. So I think sometimes also saying like kind of building up you know, at your peer level can also help by if you feel that it, if you feel that a community is really insular, right, that can be a challenge or, or going explicitly to networking events or networks that are events that are designed to introduce you to the community can also be more beneficial. Um, because I think sometimes, like Ralph said, it's just a straight up rejection and everyone's insular and mean and then you don't want to be part of that. Right. But also sometimes, you know, it, you know, we're so sensitive and we put ourselves out there and it's our science and, you know, one little bad word and feels like your life has no meaning, even that's not true. Right. And so sometimes backing it up and saying, like, let me just talk to this other person that seems like me. Right. And then you can and then you grow your own community as you continue to hopefully age in your community. Right. Then you kind of grow up together. Right. So I think that there's a little bit of like kind of social engineering with how you interact here um, mm. that might not be as, as immediately intuitive as you would expect. Go to the poster sessions. Yeah. That would be another, uh, uh, one way to defy rejection. I think that I'm rereading the question. You can defy rejection by, <laughs> by going to the poster session afterwards and meeting about 30 interesting people. And mm -hmm. uh, then, you, then you won't feel as uh, rejected. You can defy it. Well, and they have to stay there and talk to you too, right? If they're at their poster. So that's even be better. You can't be they're rejected. They're socially grateful, but also intellectually grateful for the interaction. Yeah. That's it's true. true. Both are true. <laughs> All right. This was fun. It's six o'clock where I am. Um, I want to thank everybody, Krista, Jessica, and Paul. Um, I really enjoyed speaking with you. And thank you, Londa, for making this all happen. Thanks, and, to, um, thanks to you all. Yeah. And I hope everyone puts this to good use and has a good evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Nice to see you. Good night. Good night.